This is SSN. Story Studio Network. I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the Most Painful Podcast. In the last episode, we spoke to Lynn Terstra about her work and research on TBI and concussions. She talked about the different types of TBI and concussions and the types of treatment to help people. If you missed this episode, you can listen to it on our Spotify or Apple feed. With a high number of veterans and others suffering from chronic pain, what is the connection between pain and osteoarthritis? What can one do to treat or help people to have a better quality of life if they have osteoarthritis? To talk to us about it today, we are joined by Dr. Eugene Matta, who is with the Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Anesthesia at McMaster University. Eugene, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Tom. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, glad to have you on. So uh, maybe I guess we'll just start this. Give us a short overview of OA and what it is and how it impacts people. Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, in a sense, uh, osteoarthritis is a very common issue for many of the Canadians. We know that uh, up to 5 million people are living with osteoarthritis in Canada currently. And uh, in the next 30 years, it's, uh, it's expected to increase to over 10 million. So quite prevalent. It's the third most common condition and disease state that we know of with uh, hypertension or high blood pressure, osteoporosis, and then osteoarthritis coming in at uh, number three. Although it it can affect really all the joints of the body, we know that's most common. About 60% of people would experience it in the hip and the knee. So very common in, in, from that perspective. You know, one of, one of the things as a, as a physical medicine rehab physician and, and we say physiatrist is we, we try to look at, you know, what effect does it have on a patient's overall quality of life? And we know that, um, you know, it has a significant impact on what we call the health-related quality of life and productivity of, of affected individuals. You know, there's almost $1,000 of lost income per year from people missing work. So up to eight to 10 days that they can miss of work secondary to that. A number of limitations, both physical, mental, psychological, that can result as a result of their inability to perform many of these kind of activities of daily living that we talk about. A a general sense, osteoarthritis, what is it, right? So everyone asks, you know, what, what does that mean? Well, basically what it is, is that the protective cartilage, so the surrounding protecting cartilage of each bone, the cushions, the ends of bones, wears down over time. And, um, you know, there's, there's a number of different causes or, or reasons as to why that would occur. We, we do see that repetitive stress to the joint or irritation to specific joints. Uh, so we see, for example, post-injury. So a lot of my, my veterans that I, that I see and, and uh, as well as my professional athletes that I, um, that I treat, um, we see that the post-injury of a particular area, there's six times increased risk of osteoarthritis to that particular area. Six times. Six times, yeah, oh, absolutely. That's a lot. You know, we we do see that those who have advanced age, so over 65, there's there's a significantly elevated prevalence. But you know, as I mentioned, with with some of our younger population who have repetitive stress and strain through the joints or injuries, you know, it, it can be seen in our younger populations in the in the mid to early 30s as well. And we we do see that uh, for a lot of the professional athletes that, that I do see. Genetics can, can play a role, uh, bone deformities as well. So these things are, are, are potential causes or aspects of it. And, and unfortunately, there's no cure for osteoarthritis itself, but we do know that there are a lot of options and opportunities to, to mitigate around or to improve function and ideally quality of life for those suffering with osteoarthritis. So what we talk about wear and tear, and I guess on the professional athletes, we can see that. And so on the veteran side, yeah. would we see, you know, the constant, uh, like heavy loads, rucksacks, that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> over time yeah. being beat around in an armed personnel carrier. Yeah. So is that why there's a higher onset of that, even though it's not, there's no injury related to that? It's just more wear and tear early on in life? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, you know, oftentimes by, by the time that I get to see the veterans, it's, it's because there's a, there's a particular area or aspect or potentially even injury that, that resulted. But yes, absolutely. They're, the repetitive stress and strain, the, the forceful activities that they're involved with on a consistent basis definitely accumulate to that. Plus, you know, your active activities of daily living. I mean, many of the, the veterans that I see are, are very active outside of you know, their, their core duties, right? So, you know, Mm -hmm. on top of what are they already do, they're, they're quite involved with other things that can accelerate that process as well. 
So what's the connection now between OA and then pain or chronic pain? Does one come before the other or vice versa? Or, you know, can someone have chronic pain somewhere else and then it's an onset after? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, they could definitely be strongly interrelated with each other for sure. You know, is it the chicken or the egg, right? And 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 you can definitely have other chronic pain conditions that are completely separate from osteoarthritis themselves. Oftentimes we'll see, and I... I tell my patients that you're kind of like a Jenga puzzle, right? So you pull a piece and the the tower wobbles a little bit and you keep pulling a piece and it can only stand up for so long until, you know, something becomes a little bit more prevalent or becomes a bit more apparent to them. So you can have a a number of different concerns or issues or, or challenges that can present either even before and can be made even worse from osteoarthritis as a result of the, depending on the degree of arthritis that uh, is there as well. So if we're talking about uh, chronic pain, we talk about, with veterans, we we talk a lot about identity and purpose after they leave. So mm-hmm. cro- no, with OA, it's more of a structural thing versus, you know, like some other chronic pain is linked to depression. You know, if you're more bummed out, you're more, you feel more hurt. Mm-hmm. OA is not that. Or, or are there chemicals or that can impact the way if you're like uh, depressed or you're, you know, you're yeah. don't have purpose in life, that kind of thing is, or is it more of a, a structural injury? Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the root cause of the underlying issue or concern can be, you know, started off, it starts off as, as potentially a structural issue. But, you know, one of the things I, I tell my patients all the time is that if we look at just the structure it's almost like we just put our blinders on and we forget everything else that occurs around you. So if you're not able to perform a particular activity, your mood and mental state take a significant impact. As I mentioned before, the 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 toll that it takes on, on employment can have a significant impact on your mood, on your social life, on your interpersonal relationships with your family and your friends. All of these things can be quite cyclical. So you know, there, although there can be, and, um, and there are many studies to indicate the, the inflammatory structural component or, or initiating component of it, they do have multiple outlying uh, effects that can emanate from that. And, in, you know, it really, if we're not addressing all of those things and we just put our blinders on and say, that's it. And, and once you fix this, everything else should take care of itself. We're kind of missing the boat in a sense. So I do, I guess it comes from our, our, you know, my chronic pain background as well too, is, is, um, you know, we try to look at, the more comprehensive holistic approach. And, and that really does factor into treatment algorithms and plans and, and ways to optimize really at the end of the day, the, the patient's quality of life. Because you talk about inflammation and, and from what I've been reading in some of the literature, I mean, sugar and those kind of things affect arthritis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So with OA, you're saying, um, so if we take like, uh, I guess low back is probably a common one. Yeah. So if, if just keep it simple for people. So if if the cartilage is worn out, so now it's bone on bone, that's my understanding. Yes. Is that the same as other arthritis that you have me in, in hand joints and that where diet can impact that inflammation? Because it's really the cartilage that's gone, right? It's not. So what is causing the inflammation if it's bone to bone? We have the answer to this, but for a listening audience, what what is that cause for that uh inflammation if it's just a structural thing like bone to bone. Yeah. So so really what it what it comes down to is when, as we mentioned, kind of those protective layers are damaged, whether that as Ms. you mentioned, whether that be in the spine, hands, knees, hips, it causes consistent friction, irritation, and the inflammation can have a significant impact leading to that ongoing pain generator that we see. So diet can definitely have a significant impact in regards to ensuring not only healthy living and quality of life, but also the nutrition to the area is appropriate. You know, there's there's significant evidence indicating the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, which talks mostly about fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and uh, showing that they're the, the greatest anti-inflammatory diets um, out there. So you know, there's um, there's quite quite a lot of evidence that would indicate that those are the recommended diets uh, for sure. Obviously, we know that there there is certain limitations uh, in regards to the, to the generation, like you would expect when there is bone on bone at that standpoint. But you know, providing that that natural anti-inflammatory component to it as well is uh, is definitely a strong component of treatment for sure. And so now, when we talk about about treatment, yeah, I guess physical conditioning is is an important component. Our muscles hold our structure up. Correct. So now if someone is struggling with OA, what, what are some things that could be done? Like say they're in pain. So how do we yeah. get them moving? How do we get, if, I guess if they're athletic, it would be different, right? They're, they're already used to that kind of 
working out routine that, but someone who may not have been as active and now they're suffering with OA, what are, what are some things that they could take away from, from this show today to help them? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the main things that I, I, I think is important to stress is um, to, even if they're an athlete, um, if they're very active or not quite active, but they find something that is different from the norm, it's it's important to to identify some of these initial symptoms. So those ones would be pain that is exceptional or out of proportion than what you'd otherwise expect. Stiffness, people will talk about often, my patients will say that specifically when waking up in the morning, they're very stiff and sore and they're able to, throughout the course of the day, improve their activity levels, reduced function, some tenderness over, say, for example, we're talking about the knee along the joints itself, losing flexibility, a grating sensation or swelling. These are some common things that you would hear or see and our patients often talk to us about that. When, when that happens or when some of these symptoms come about, it's really important that we, and we, we want to try to take away from today, is providing this education of what to do next, right? And um, it's important that we, we, you know, we go and seek further assistance, either from our primary care physician, uh, physiotherapist, colleagues, occupational therapists, who can give us this, this information in terms of how do we modify particular aspects of our day-to-day lives. So when I talk to my patients about pain management, as a whole, and and specifically with osteoarthritis, I like to break it down into four compartments. So we we call it like the four pronged approach to care. So the first thing that um, I I stress, which I think is really the most important, and one of those that we know has the best long-term outcomes uh, for patients when they're able to self-engage with some of these active, as opposed to more passive interventions, is that we call it the conservative approach. So one of the things that we, we talk about is weight management, right? So that's a, that's a first um, one of the things that, we'll, that comes to mind. And we know that with each pound of weight loss, there's up to a fourfold reduction in load bearing through a particular joint. So this is huge when we're talking about a knee or a hip specifically. So, so big, big, um, you know, important aspects to consider. Physical activity and is, a, is another, obviously, very important and targeted aspect. We know that cardiovascular fitness and resistance, we, we kind of gauge in Health Canada tells us about 150 minutes total per week, 30 minutes per day, five days a week is, is something that we look at. But also, we call it neuromuscular control activities. So these are things which you, you may have heard about with Tai Chi which does help to control specific activities and slow rhythmic movements, low load exercise programs. So things like swimming or cycling can be very helpful and are are strongly encouraged. The next component of that uh, is assisted devices. So those can be things like walking aids, canes, walking poles, shock absorbing shoes. So these are types of things which which can definitely be uh, utilized. And as well, you know, if it get very common, you may see them with people walking around with knee braces and they can have knee braces that provide some additional structural support and stability for different areas of where this arthritis may be kicking in. Then the next aspect, which again is still under this conservative approach is, is joint protection. So it's the idea of, of understanding how to mitigate and work around your activities to make sure that you're not putting yourself at increased risk or increased harm. So avoiding particular activities that would otherwise bring on pain. So if it's for the knee, again, we would say squatting, kneeling, twisting, low seats. We can do other things where we can have raised toilet seats or raised bed to accommodate around these particular activities that you need to do, but maybe won't be as pain provoking if you make some modifications to it. This is where our occupational therapists help us quite a lot. A lot of things too, as I hear from, from again, veterans and, and athletes is that, you know, I used to do this, I used to get all done in one day, And that was it. I didn't have to space myself out or plan things around it. Well, you know, when you have some underlying pain concern, whether that be osteoarthritis or anything else, we have to learn about things we call pacing, planning, and prioritizing our activities around our pain generators. So, you know, our pain psychology colleagues, um, as well as physiotherapists, can definitely help us with these particular aspects to mitigate and work around our activities to ensure we can still complete them but just not at the same level as we were before. So breaking them up into intervals can be quite helpful. Again, under the conservative uh, approach as well, we know that uh, self-management, so there's there's a number of uh, studies that indicate that psychosocial interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy may help with the management of osteoarthritis and function. 
and then we have the, the kind of the basic things, which I think a lot of our, uh, our patients and listeners probably use is, is ice to the affected areas, um, elevation, compression, these types of things can be quite helpful and can be done, you know, in your, in your home environment. So that's conservative, very big, big uh, grouping, but at the same time, things that you can do typically in your own home setting, you don't, maybe you may need some assistance with them, but mostly taking an active approach to your care moving forward. And I guess too, the other thing too, as we age is also muscle loss, right? And the impact yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. Of and then, absolutely. you know, you talk about weight loss, you know, I know, well, I'm one of those people where I have a hard time putting on weight and putting on muscle, right? So yep, I'm the opposite yep, end of it yep, too. Yep. But that, but that's all important to support support the body as well as we age. So I guess, you know, these kind of things from what I'm hearing you say too is, you know, pre- prevention is key is maybe if we're in, you know, if we're in the military or professional athletes or people who have hard jobs is to start working out earlier in your life if you're not already doing that to try to maintain muscle, maintain health so that it's, you know, as you get hit by this, you at least have something to to kind of help you out or to, what's the right word, have some reserves in the tank to help you through the Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I talk to my patients a lot about having that supporting structure or scaffolding around the joint. So again, if we're referring to the knee, it's it's strengthening the muscles above and below the joint to provide that extra stability and support so we can offload some of the area or this repetitive stress and strain through the joint, you know, is, is really key. And as you mentioned, a lot of our patients can find that strengthening those muscles and providing that extra stability and support is, is really all they need at times, especially in the early stages where we will not have to intervene to other aspects or other areas. Um, and these are things that they can do either with some minimal guidance or even at home alone, right? So the, these are some huge important points. So for people who are suffering with early onset of OA and they're doing all what you just talked about under the conservative um, regime, can they live into an older age without getting into the surgical interventions or, or walking aids and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the most important things that we talk about, again, pain as a whole, but a specific osteoarthritic, uh, osteoarthritic type pain is we don't ever really treat an image. We, we treat a person. So we want to know what your function is like. And, and if you were able to perform your activities of daily living or your, you know, your extracurricular activities and your function isn't significantly impaired or you're able to modify it as with some of those tools and strategies that we talked about earlier, then, then absolutely. I mean, surgery would not be warranted or indicated. We typically leave surgery for the very last stage um, in some cases, and, and we would say that that would be one of them. And once we've tried a number of other conservative roads uh, and approaches, then we would consider or have the discussion in regards to that. So I, I think I cut you off, but you started your your first point there, and then which was conservative, and then <laughs> next one. Yeah, yeah. You know that, that was that's typically our first prong approach. Is, as I mentioned, the conservative aspects. Um, the the second aspect is when we talk about medication management. So there are a number of different uh, topical creams, anti-inflammatories that uh, that our, our patients will typically use and, and can be recommended. And then there's a whole set of oral medications that are also suggested and, and are approved through Health Canada in regards to using and helping to reduce the pain in which they're experiencing. So topical uh, creams such as diclofenac, so it's an anti-inflammatory, can be purchased over the counter throughout Canada. And typically we would, you know, we ask our patients to apply it to the affected area, whether it be again in the, the fingers or the knee, and you can apply it a couple, three, two to three times a day. Typically it needs to be put on and those segmented intervals, I usually tell my patients breakfast, lunch, and dinner is quite helpful to remember those those intervals to ensure that it's able to, to break through the, the layers of the skin and down to the affected area. There are a number of different compounded uh, creams as well, which which patients re- will use from time to time, and they, they find them quite helpful. Typically, we would we would start off with the anti-inflammatory kinds. Tylenol, you know, is, is something, again, it's, a, it's our first line really recommended medication that can be used, purchased over the counter. And uh, we talk about using reasonable doses would be maximum three grams a day of the Tylenol, but usually tell people, let's try once or twice a day, and you can always ramp up as as necessary or as appropriate um, or reasonable options. Oral anti-inflammatories as well as the, you know, leaves and uh, some other ones, medications that that have anti-inflammatory properties, but also stomach protectors and coatings can also be quite helpful. And then, um, you know, once once we've tried those, there, there are a couple of other ones which are recommended, again, through Health Canada, but kind of our, our lower end ones in terms of on the line, where we 
use medications such as we call Cymbalta. And then um, there's also a talk of certain times in certain situations where you would consider the use of opioids. But again, that wouldn't be something that we would jump to right away by any means. Yeah. And you would be seeing a professional from there anyway. Absolutely. So now you said you had two more points, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So the, the, the third point um, are interventions or procedures. So oftentimes you'll, you'll hear uh, patients uh, say, well, I had a, a knee injection at cortisone. Uh, I had a steroid in my knee. So, so those are one component of it. There are a number of different in- injectables that, uh, that can be done into the knee. Um, the, the evidence would indicate that for you know for both hip and knee osteoarthritis, they they can corticosteroid can be effective in reducing pain and improving function for typically up to three months in total. But you know the, the again the evidence and the consensus in regards to how many and how frequent is is a variable to an extent. But we we want to try to use as many steroid sparing interventions as possible if we can. There are also lubricants or gels, we call them visco supplements, uh, which basically cushion support and as well as provide that anti-inflammatory component. And there's some newer injectates that we're looking at in terms of platelet-rich plasma or PRP, which is which is often talked about and looked into, and some others that are not available in Canada, such as stem cells and so on that are, are studied throughout uh, throughout the world. And then our last one, so our very last one is surgery. So, and then that's... Uh, that's when we've kind of, you know, exhausted, we've worked our way up the ladder, we've had an opportunity to try and, and see if we can try more, some of those conservative to more invasive approaches. And if need be, then uh, we look into some of those additional aspects. Yeah, so from what, what I'm hearing is, and I've, I've heard this from other experts and been reading a bit about it on too, is really is to start early in life, stay fit, have a good lifestyle, be proactive with your health. Absolutely. Because it sounds like we're all going to get this. Some some of us are going to get it earlier than, depending on our jobs, are going to get it earlier than anybody else. But that's kind of the number one thing I'm getting from this is be proactive with your health, stay strong, diet, the whole nine yards, everything we hear about. Right. And, and I guess, you know, we always hear professionals say, you got to exercise, you got to exercise. But we're not getting like, well, what does that mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What does that look like? Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. So I think those are the, uh, that would probably be a, a talk for another day, but. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as well as, is to, to understand that there's many, many options to help address um, osteoarthritis as well. And, and, you know, some, some patients will say, well, I just need an injection. Well, you maybe, you maybe you don't, right. And they, maybe there are some other opportunities that we don't have to dive into this particular aspect and we can get, we can achieve just as, as great a benefit from other opportunities that we mentioned before. And, and, you know, I I think it's 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 important for your listeners as well to, to note that there's a lot of great information available and easily free access. So, you know, Arthritis Canada, arthritis.ca has tremendous amount of information, patient stories, you know, things that, that you can work through in terms of medication management, as well as active conservative measures. And, and there's a number of great resources that are available, podcasts from experts there as well, too, that can talk about and, and kind of relay some of that information, which is excellent. And arthritisresearch.ca and this, the SOAR program, which is stopping osteoarthritis, particularly for knee. Great uh, insight from from a number of professionals there that can help to, you know, really guide you and and, um, and see may ensure that you have full access to all the education and the opportunities available to you. So that's called SOAR. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And I guess the key is to keep moving, keep walking, yeah, all that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, motion is lotion. That's that's the key that uh, that we always hear. So I think that's a really important one. And um, you know, that's if you if you're able to do that, I think that's that's half the battle sometimes. Well, we've run out of time. Love to talk. Okay. I'd love to talk more about it, honestly, because yeah. like you say, it yeah. it's it's a huge topic. And the reason I thought about this too is, you know, many veterans I spoke to are all talking about it. You know, they're they're talk because they get it in early age. A lot of them. And, um, mm-hmm. so we thought, well, let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So, but I'm, I'm sure we could talk more about it, but, um, for today, I think we're going to have to stop here. No problem. No problem. Excellent. Well, thanks for being on the show, uh, Eugene. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. And for our next show, uh, we're going to be talking with Leroy Ho, who is a uh, physiotherapist. He's going to talk about uh, exercise and strengthening when someone suffers from chronic pain. So it's going to tie into what we're talking about today. So that'll be on uh, our next episode. For feedback about the show or more information on chronic pain, you can visit our website, veteranschronicpain.ca. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at chronicpaincoe and on Instagram at chronicpain underscore coe. Once again, Eugene, thanks for being on the show. Excellent. Thanks very much. A lot of good knowledge and I'm sure the audience will have a lot of takeaways from from this discussion today. And everybody else, uh, stay safe and keep the hope alive. The most painful podcast.
is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.